Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name is uh, Jamie Fisher and I'm the director of the UC Davis Humanities Institute. Uh, thank you for coming this evening to our event, which is uh, our first online version of the conversation, our conversation event, which um, tries to do kind of outreach to the community in general through programs at the UC Davis Humanities Institute. Um, this is the first time we're doing it online. Obviously, circumstances dictated that we figure out a way to uh, kind of live stream this. Uh, but we are live um, with Mike Davis, Joshua Clover, and Kathy Wallerstein. So people will have an opportunity to ask questions, as Kathy will outline through, uh, through the chat room. So um, our format's going to be that I'm going to hand this off. Um, I'm operating the technology, so I'm going to step back and, and kind of watch the way that uh, the technology is operating. Kathy Wallerstein, the Associate Director of the UC Davis Humanities Institute, is going to do the formal introductions and moderate this evening uh, the conversation between uh, Mike Davis and uh, Joshua Clover. Uh, before we do that, just a quick thanks to all the uh, DHI staff, to Kathy, Stephanie, Elliot, and Gina for all the testing of this technology uh, they really made tonight possible. So thanks all for attending, and um, have, a good, have a good event. Thanks, Jamie. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to the UC um, Davis Humanities Institute's new online series bringing together critical perspectives on the current crisis. Um, Jamie just mentioned a few words about it. I'm really thrilled to be opening uh, the series with an interview of Mike Davis, and I want to extend my thanks to Mike for agreeing to do this and to Joshua for agreeing to interview him. I'd also like to thank Haymarket Books for sharing with us their indispensable how-to manual for putting together an event of this size online. Without them, we could not have pulled this off. And a huge thanks goes out to the DHI staff for their hard work in putting this event together so quickly. So I'm gonna introduce our guests who will speak for about 45 minutes, after which we'll take some questions, which you can post in the YouTube comments section. Um, in order to ensure that one person doesn't dominate the question thread, we've instituted a mechanism so that you have to wait 30 seconds before asking a second question. So please keep this in mind and be as concise as possible in your wording. Questions will be selected by our staff and then sent to me to read. So without further ado, I will introduce our guests. Mike Davis is an award-winning writer, historian, political activist, and contributing editor to The Nation. He is distinguished visiting professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of San Diego and Professor Emeritus at UC Riverside. A recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Award, Davis is author of 15 books, including Prisoners of the American Dream, City of Courts, Ecology of Fear, Lake, Late Victorian Holocausts, Planet of Slums, and Old Gods, New Enigmas, Marx's Lost Theory. His latest book, Set the Night on Fire, LA in the 60s, co-authored with John Wiener, just came out this month. Most pertinent perhaps to this discussion, and certainly to this moment, is his 2005 book, The Monster at Our Door, The Global Threat of Avian Flu, which is soon to be republished with a new introduction and epilogue. Joshua Clover is a writer, theorist, and organizer. His scholarly work mostly concerns the political economy of social movements. He's written several, seven books, including Riot, Strike, Riot, The New Era of Uprisings, now translated into six languages, Roadrunner, coming out in spring 2021, and he's at work on a book called Camp and Commune concerning the strategy of anti-infrastructural encampments at the intersection of fossil capital and settler colonialism. He is a professor of English literature and comparative literature at UC Davis, as well as an affiliated professor of literature and modern culture at the University of Copenhagen. He is reviews editor for Commune Magazine and edits the single series for Duke University Press. Welcome, Mike, and welcome, Joshua. And now I will hand it over to you, Joshua. Thank you very much, Kathy and Jamie, and hi, everyone, in this weird way. I'm extremely excited to be here talking to Mike Davis. Kathy pr pretended that we're we're both the participants. I'm going to ask questions, and and Mike's going to um, uh, think think through the, the present issues with us. And I both trust and hope he'll do the the real lion's share of the talking, because I've been waiting to talk to Mike for basically my whole life. I have many many questions. We will definitely not get to them all, but I'll try and do my best to make sure we get to some of the ones that I think are are central. Uh, but I want to start, the, the theme is, of, of course, that uh, uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, and, and geopolitics. I want to sort of start with an origin question. Uh, in, Mike, in, in your book, Monster at Our Door, 
you identify the source of avian flu in Guangdong, but also in sort of the global arrangement of the livestock revolution, the planetary network of capitalist production and corruption and exploitation and so on. I wonder if you could just sort of talk us through the COVID-19 origin story uh, in, in sort of the, in light of that history. Sure. Uh, the first coronavirus was discovered in the 30s and very shortly after they used uh, one of the earliest electron microscopes to actually image it. And it struck the researchers that it looked like a solar eclipse. And uh, these petals, these surface proteins that began out of the circumference, uh, they thought looked like the, uh, the sun's corona during an eclipse. Coronaviruses until the emergence of uh, SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, in 1963, were principally concerned to veterinary science because they caused serious uh, epidemics amongst a wide variety of animals. Coronaviruses are experts at leaping from species to species, although it was only after uh, SARS in, 19, in 2003 that bats were identified as the uh, principal reservoir. Uh, it's an animal pandemic. They also have, I'm sorry, disease. They also have a variety of modes of entry into animals' bodies in a, in a variety of ways in which they uh, damage these bodies. In animals, the most damaging, dangerous route is the fecal oral route. They begin as an gastrointestinal infection and work their way to uh, the lungs and the heart. That's a relevant fact now because uh, a minority of the cases from very early on when they were first studied in, in China in January occur as gastrointestinal uh, infections. And there's some very real possibility that now as uh, the pandemic spreads through Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, other places where people have poor sanitation, that that could become a more common mode of infection. And what nobody knows of, uh, is whether, as within animals, the uh, enteric mode, the fecal oral mode, will be more deadly. It certainly is in the animal cases. Only two coronaviruses uh, were known in 1963 and 2003 to infect humans. Both of them causes the common cold, and both of them only causing uh, uh, mild disease. But they did have one characteristic that was striking, which is after catching the cold from one of these coronaviruses, uh, you gain very little immunity very short <clears throat> temporary immunity. Right now, uh, medical researchers across the world are struggling to understand uh, what kind of immunity occurs to people who now test negative but, but definitely had uh, the disease. The ideal case, of course, that it would give you uh, a year or more total immunity. But there's evidence to the contrary. It's a very mixed bag at this point. But it will become, this will be one of the decisive uh, uh, parameters. So SARS emerged in 2003 and was quickly identified as being uh, avian flu. There was an avian flu outbreak at the same time. Uh, but in fact, it, uh, only a group of kind of heroic researchers in Hong Kong, <coughs> pardon me, pursued the research and, and discovered, no, that it was a coronavirus. The thing about the SARS uh, epidemic, it caused a, a big world panic uh, at the time and suddenly turned research community to looking at human transmitted coronaviruses. But the thing about SARS was that basically you only spread SARS when you became symptomatic. And in 2012, uh, another deadly uh, coronavirus pathogen emerged, passed to humans by animals, above all camels, in Saudi Arabia, in nearby countries called the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And its origins were traced back to 
uh, tomb bats. It's it's literally the, the the curse of the mummy's tomb. It comes from the bats that uh, live in the pyramids and uh, Egyptian tombs. It's still circulating. It's killed less than a thousand people, but a very high death rate. It kills about forty percent of the people. But again, like SARS, was basically communicable only in the symptomatic state. So what has been most surprising and most uh, dangerous uh, about the, the new virus, SARS-CoV-2, is that it flies on the wings of influenza. That is, it can be spread <clears throat> by people who are pre-symptomatic, not yet developed symptoms, and it can be spread by people who are asymptomatic, uh, who never display open systems. And that is a, a, a radical and deeply uh, disturbing property of the new virus. Like other uh, viruses that emerge from uh, uh, China, it may not have started, but it certainly passed through what's known as a wet market, uh, a market in which live animals are sold. Uh, both for food consumption, but also for medicinal, medicinal purposes. And coronavirus, uh, the intermediate carrier of it, was most likely uh, a skilled man either called the pendulum, uh, of which immense numbers are actually uh, uh, consumed in China. But mainly, I think, I'm not sure exactly, but I think their scales are ground up and, and used as part of traditional Chinese medicine. It's a bit disturbing that after SARS in 2003 and after avian flu, which appeared in wet markets amongst uh, chickens that had, had contact with wild birds, that these markets weren't closed down. But they're traditionally uh, an important part of the food industry and of household consumption, particularly in uh, Southern China. But before we go on last, uh, to the next question, I want to make uh, one last point in that it, an epidemic is never simply the pathogen and the spectrum of effects it, it produces. Uh, it's also equally the bodies of the people uh, and infects. And in a very real sense, from an immunological point of view, there are two different humanities. We live in a humanity where the majority of people eat well, have decent health, and have access to medical care. A minority of us don't fall into that category as a result of poverty and racism, but probably 75% of the American population does. If you go to the world's slums and look at the two billion poorest people in the world, it's actually the reverse. A majority of people sometimes standing up to uh, 60 or 70 percent are immune compromised because of existing uh, diseases like uh, HIV, which still uh, infects 24 million Africans, or tuberculosis is widespread, and especially malnutrition. And malnutrition, which the UN hope would drastically be reduced uh, in the last two decades in Africa. It's actually increased. The number of children, for instance, young children who suffer some form of sunny growth has increased by millions. So the pre-existing condition in African parts of South Asia that differentiates itself from West Europe, the United States, is malnutrition. Uh, greatly compromises the immune system. So right now, as the pandemic courses through sub-Saharan Africa, parts of India and the subcontinent, uh, it's very likely the disease will be reshaped, assume a more, uh, even more deadly uh, form. So we may be actually just standing on the threshold of the, of the real massacre that will be associated with the pandemic. <laughs> Give you a chance, among other things, to put in a plug for another of your books. Uh, obviously, we've all been very attentive to Monster in Our Door, which is being re-released. But 
Um, I, I, I'm also have, have learned a great deal from the book Planet of Slums, which exactly takes up this question of what we sometimes call surplus populations, uh, people who've been pushed out or never included in the global economy in various ways and are living in these mega slums and facing these uh, are more exposed to pandemics like this, among other things. And I think that, too, is uh, I found very useful reading and thinking about the, the current situation. The, the question I want to ask you about is sort of about global differences uh, as we move toward the question of geopolitics or geoeconomics. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the different responses to the pandemic uh, in different regions. Of course, there's, there's endless debates in the United States. There's a great discussion about how much we should blame China or how China handled it, but also very different handling in South Korea or Singapore or Italy and so on. And I, I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the different approaches to addressing the pandemic that you've watched unfold and how we might think about them in terms of, you know, useful, not useful, what's possible, what's not possible. Well, of course, pandemic planning has been going on uh, for almost a generation. And there are very clear rules what to do in the beginning. Uh, of an outbreak. They're codified in the World Health Organization's regulations, and they've been more or less uh, universally adopted. And that depends on the possession of, of sufficient tests. I'm sorry, something's, uh, something's going on in the background. Let me turn back. I apologize to all the listeners. Well, well, it's gone. Okay, I apologize. So anyway, I mean, every country in the world, every uh, national health service, public health service in the world, understands what you should do at the beginning, which is you test your earliest cases, then you do contact tracing to find out everybody they've been in contact with, and then you isolate. And this is what has been done so successfully. Like in Taiwan, uh, I think that the number of deaths only in two figures now, incredibly. South Korea has been uh, successful at that. Uh, Hong Kong and China, after the initial disaster where they tried to suppress information about the, uh, the pandemic and refused to isolate uh, people, returned finally when the national government took charge. Uh, with this hugely uh, successful campaign. Anyway, that's what all governments were expected to do. The United States has had a program uh, uh, which has built basically a, a early warning system around the world. This uh, predated the Obama administration, but after Ebola, which President Obama considered a major threat to national security, they poured a lot more money into it. Uh, this program uh, was defunded uh, last September, and it was vital not only to American public health, but to the public health uh, of the world. But when it came to, to Europe, in the beginning, the response was not entirely different from that in the United States. Uh, the European equivalent of the American CDC, European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, said uh, only a low, maybe moderate risk of it getting out of control. That was the position of the European uh, Commission. And so it was only late in the day, in March, uh, that Europe, in something of panic, began to implement these measures. And in some countries, it was too late uh, to follow the the primary procedure, which was the uh, test and sci-fi isolation. So you ended up with blanket quarantines. It's always been considered uh, uh, the least satisfactory way of trying to uh, halt the disease. Really only something that uh, you apply after you fail to uh, contain it. And then the United States with the Trump administration has been so busy dismantling anything that bore uh, President Obama's name on it. Uh, cut back the CDC, eliminated the uh, uh, 
World Health Directorate inside the National Security Council, which was essentially a voice inside the White House for the CDC. Uh, Trump, uh, or actually John Bolton, is Trump's national security advisor, decided uh, to dismantle it, and he fired everybody. He fired the administrators who were the most experienced and had the longest histories of confronting diseases like Ebola, avian flu, SARS, uh, uh, before then. So in a way, uh, uh, it, the Trump administration has been its own best fifth column because it, for often what I think are purely irrational reasons, there's simply hatred of anything that Obama did had dismantled the, the frontline institutions. But that is, is part of a, a larger institutional uh, meltdown uh, where, where the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund still remain giants and uh, in some aspects all powerful. Other international institutions have either collapsed or been totally sidelined. That is the World Health Organization, the uh, American CDC, and in Europe, where in the European Union, nations, the individual nations are responsible for their own health systems. But there is a protocol uh, in, in the treaty uh, that provides for mutual aid and assistance and a coordinated response in the event of a major epidemic uh, or pandemic. And this was actually invoked by, uh, by Italy in February, and absolutely every country in the EU ignored it, totally uh, ignored it. Spain invoked it because they were desperate for aid from their European sisters. None of them provided aid. The only country to step up and promise considerable aid to Italy was China, none of the European partners. And now we look at a situation where it's almost certain that the uh, right-wing anti-European uh, Northern League party, led by this guy Salmini, uh, is going to come back to power. There will be a referendum on the EU. Uh, more than two-thirds of Italians are in favor of leaving. So Brexit was uh, just the beginning. So. Europe is a floundering giant. Yeah, I think mean, that leads me into the next question I want to ask, which I think is the big ticket question in some, in some sense, as we turn to that question of geopolitics, since it concerns the role of the EU and the uh, structural integrity of the EU, among other things. Uh, and this is, so you, you've uh, laid out in a, in a note you wrote, uh, three possible futures that you see emerging uh, possible directions as we move through and beyond um, the epidemic and the, the COVID depression. And you've given those three possibilities the names of deglobalization, that's one, uh, the Chinese New World Order, and global Weimar. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you can sort of uh, lay out the, the contents of those three categories, and then I'll try and ask some follow-up questions to draw out uh, more details. Okay, so we've all been taught for 30 years or so that globalized uh, production and finance, or the, the world as it is and as it will be uh, forever, all that is thrown into uh, question because the pandemic has coincided with the situation that for the last year or two, Virtually every economic colonist business journal in the world has been saying when. They've all agreed that recession was imminent. Uh, one of its major uh, causes would be accumulated debt in all parts of uh, financial systems everywhere. Well, it turns out that the pandemic was the detonator of this crisis and ensured that the recession uh, is turning into uh, a depression and promises a very long period uh, ahead of high unemployment and so on. So the three scenarios are simply this, that economic nationalists 
take control over the crisis. And they repatriate large parts of the international production systems, this so-called uh, value chain, either directly to their homeland or to adjacent nations. In Germany's case, that would be Poland or Slovakia. In our case, it might be uh, Mexico. And this may sound good to the ears of some people, uh, like Steve Bannon or other members of the Trump administration, but the cost of it uh, would probably be enormous in terms of world growth, because China last year supplied 40% of the growth in the world uh, economy. Chinese economy is nine times larger than it was in 2003 when SARS. And in this scenario, it would, would bring about uh, an immense crisis in China, the largest manufacturing and trading economy uh, in, in the world. So it's hard to imagine any kind of stabilization can emerge from a purely fragmented and nationalist attempts to uh, solve the crisis. Basically what happened in the 1930s when uh, after a brief restoration of free trade and the gold standard in the 1920s, during the Depression, uh, the world economy broke up into uh, autarkic uh, trading blocks, uh, and uh, world trade fell to unprecedentedly uh, low levels. The second case is uh, advertised by China's response to the crisis in other countries. Um, Although the Cubans, as always, Cuban doctors are really should be our heroes. They're always first on the scene. They take the most risk. Um, a lot of them died fighting Ebola. But it's in China that's mounted the major response. And even to the point now that uh, Governor Cuomo's waiting at the tarmac for the uh, planes to come into China with aid that's been granted to New York. But they also are the major uh, aid, aid providers to African countries, to many Latin American countries, and so on. In other words, the U.S. has forfeited any claim to humanitarian leadership or to a leading role within world organizations uh, like the World Health Organization or the Food and Agriculture Organization. The same thing with uh, uh, Europe. So China will gain a lot of soft power out of this, a lot of prestige, and it needs it desperately as its hard economic power. The so-called Belt and Road Program in so many countries has turned the, uh, the Chinese into the country's chief creditors. Countries have taken on uh, debts uh, that they never should have taken on. And so there's a lot of resentment building against China in all kinds of places, in Sri Lanka, in Kenya, uh, in West Africa. So China really needed this. But the question that naturally arises then, are we witnessing, as a historian, I just read wrote something about the plague in the 17th century, which particularly devastated Italy. And he argues that the plague was it accelerated the process of and this is a very Wallacean world systems concept, uh, accelerated the transition from a Mediterranean-centered economy to uh, an Atlantic-centered economy. So one might ask, well, isn't this what's really happening now? This is an acceleration of the transition from a world organized and dominated by Washington uh, to one to Beijing. I don't think the analogy fits uh, China is prime with economic uh, contradictions. It's been unsuccessful in moving its economy away from in, uh, huge infrastructural investments and uh, exports to internal consumption. Uh, you know, there is an immense, you could fill a library just with the books asking when will the Chinese bubble burst? What's wrong with the Chinese? Economy. I don't think that China is stable enough uh, to take a leading role in economic uh, 
reconstruction after the, the pandemic ends. And then there's a, a kind of Vimerian scenario, which is a partial restoration of internationalized production, uh, preserving value chains, partial reconstruction of international institutions. Uh, big countries cannot afford to have their workforces laid off for uh, uh, months at a time. There will be aggressive uh, uh, progress in, in developing antivirals uh, and vaccines. So this is the kind of world that Joe Biden might play a key role in for uh, a couple of years. But it's ultimately uh, an unstable world. Uh, it is subject to all the centrifugal forces that we see now even if it postpones the crisis. It's Vimerian because it looks a bit like the international order uh, that existed in the, in the middle 1920s, but it's not a lasting world order. And on the sidelines, smiling and patting themselves in the back are the gods of chaos. And I think you, know, you have to see them uh, as the solution. Neither of the three scenarios that I mentioned yeah, I think, I mean, what's striking to me about those three scenarios, and I, I, I wish I could uh, eventually uh, master sort of the clarity that, that you have in laying those out. What's striking to me is, is that in all of them, I think, um, maybe with the exception of the first one, the pandemic doesn't play the role of a new or unique phenomenon. You, you said a detonator, um, or maybe I would just say an intensifier, right? So the the collapse of the EU and its sort of renationalization. That's been going on at least since 2008 with the, the fallout of Greece that can never quite leave and then Brexit and, and various countries with these rising nationalist, both economic and, and cultural nationalist movements across Europe, right? Not universally, but it's been a consistent and, and developing phenomenon. And similarly, the sort of limited rise of China, which you're right, like there's there's a library of books about how China is about to collapse, but also a library of books about how China is about to take over the world. And no one can resolve the contradiction, but it doesn't seem like it's on its way to doing it. It doesn't seem like it can deliver what the United States delivered, you know, more than a century ago, what the United Kingdom delivered long before that, which is massive global growth. Uh, and China doesn't seem able to deliver that. So in all these cases, it seems like uh, the pandemic is intensifying things already in process. Does that seem like a fair way to think about it? Or are we seeing various unique configurations or brand new configurations emerge? No, I think these are important points. And you can, of course, have a uh, a kind of dying status quo and new configurations at the same time. But the new configurations have to congeal into uh, some kind of order and appoint uh, a manager over world trade to uh, have any chance of, of bringing uh, a return to prosperity. I should point out that um, right now the European Central Bank uh, is determined to make Spain and Italy the new Greeces because those countries uh, are pleading desperately for uh, corona bonds, you know, for uh, loans, particularly to saving the Italian case, its small business sector. Anybody who knows Italy has been to Italy, you know, it has incredible high-tech, large-scale industries, but is also uh, preeminently a, a nation of shopkeepers to, to the same extent, possibly even more than uh, of France. And the political fallout from the destruction of so much of the retail uh, sector in Italy would be, uh, would be huge. But the European Central Bank controlled, of course, by Germany and its uh, northern allies, uh, the Netherlands uh, in Belgium. Uh, insist that they're going to have to, you know, uh, like going to any bank and asking for a loan. They're going to have to pay interest for this. This is an incredibly short-sighted uh, and dangerous uh, uh, policy. 
in the case of China, China still depends on its exports. Everything from patio furniture to, uh, to cell phones. That's what's responsible. It's huge trade surplus is what generates uh, the enormous uh, reserves. I think the last time I looked at three and a half trillion dollars, which gives uh, China huge financial power because of its ability uh, uh, to loan that. But if world, uh, if the export industry shrinks by 10 or 15 percent, that'll be magnified through the economy. And China has this huge internal bubble. I mean, at a certain point, it's necessary to, to build roads and high-speed trains and more housing. But the tendency is that that kind of accumulation by investment in capital goods and real estate ends up with it all being misallocated in the wrong places. So China's ended up with this staggering number of empty condominiums, which are priced beyond the ability of ordinary Chinese uh, uh, to pay. Cities have sprawled and expanded uh, in ways that uh, uh, now turn out to be the worst kind of bad, bad planning. So the internal debt structure of China, and this is what happened, that library of books is about, uh, faces some day of reckoning. So far, the fact that the banks are all state-owned and incredibly secretive, they've been able to do things like turn the equivalent of junk bonds into uh, high-quality uh, assets through a kind of financial leisure domain. Uh, so, you know, China has the possibility of a chain reaction crisis that could spread from uh, losses in the export sector uh, through the property markets and through the financial uh, structure and eventually work its way down to uh, the village level. Or maybe it'll start in the financial structure first and then work its way through the other. This is why China is a, is a very dubious candidate uh, to be the engine uh, that will restore the economy. They were in 2008, of course. Their stimulus program in 2008 uh, was judged a huge success, but it left an enormous overhang of, uh, of debt. Uh, it was it was China, not Obama, who uh, pulled the world out of the 2008-2009 uh, recession. I doubt very much it can play that role today. And it's also the case, right, that a lot of their cash reserves are dollar-denominated, uh, which, which uh, I wonder if you think that puts them on a collision course with the United States, uh, sort of a struggle over what the global reserve currency is going to be and whether that plays a role in sort of a reapportioning of global power over the next 20 years, 30 years. Well, here's a huge lump in the road in any uh, progress toward some kind of new international order, which is right now, Everybody is flocking to the dollar. Everyone is unloading uh, assets denominated in national <coughs> uh, currencies. And as the dollar, of course, strengthens, it raises the real cost of debt and borrowing in all the other countries of the world where they borrow, borrowed in, uh, in dollars. And the fact that China is the largest single owner of our national debt right. is always problematic because on one hand you think, well, they can push a button and bring us down, so we better uh, learn to live live with them. But we would bring them down, uh, you know, as well. And yeah. I think any attempt right now to, uh, is, say, the United States re repatriates production to here. Uh, the Chinese attempt to repeat, patriate, uh, and sell off their American uh, 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 bonds. Uh, this only adds to uh, the disorder in the world system and the likelihood of a prolonged recession or depression. Yeah, that's right. So I want I want to ask you one more question, and then I, I'm hoping if it's okay with the the team that we can open it up to questions from the entire world. Uh, so my last 
question for you is, I think, probably a predictable one, uh, but I'll ask it anyway, which is, I wonder what you think are the possibilities that the crisis and the prolonged road out of crisis, uh, what possibilities those might have opened up for an explicitly anti-capitalist movement at the level either of sort of local organizing practices, which I know you've given your life to, um, but also sort of international social movements. And I wonder if you think uh, there even is still a left internationalism to be found out there. Well, there's, of course, an enormous culture of solidarity being born. And it's, first of all, created by uh, the health workers uh, on the front lines of this, but by all the other people whose lives have been put at stake and who I believe will soon turn to unionizing Amazon and, uh, you know, the other companies that uh, uh, expect people to go to work for 12 or $15 without face masks or any uh, uh, protection. But on a larger level, if you look at either the European left or the American left, uh, I don't think in my memory has ever been uh, less committed publicly to internationalist uh, causes. I mean, I'm greatly cheered by the Sanders campaign. I didn't hear the candidate mention any time. He, he was good on Palestine, but he never mentioned global poverty. Uh, there were a million things that, that uh, could be said. So there's a world crisis of solidarity crisis of solidarity amongst capitalist countries uh, themselves, a lack of solidarity between uh, uh, regions often, but also a, dim a diminished solidarity and in internationalism amongst uh, the left. And our future really depends on, on changing that. And as we all know, for Trump, American first means Africa last. And I take aid to Africa right now as being the most imperiled continent where ordinary people have the most uh, to lose, to really be a, a litmus test of anybody who calls himself uh, a progressive or claims to be uh, a, member, a member of the left. And we have to, out of the ashes of this, rebuild movements that uh, are truly internationalist and the role of the left as the founders put it in the communist manifesto is different from the mainstream of the labor movement only in two ways that is to represent the struggles of the future and the struggles of the present but secondly to represent the interests of the whole global working class in the struggle of any local or national uh, contention and it's the second responsibility that weighs most heavily on my mind. Thank you. For that. So I want to encourage, take this opportunity to encourage uh, our viewers. I never thought I'd say those words. I want to encourage our viewers. I feel like a telethon host suddenly. I want to encourage our viewers to, uh, if you have questions for Mike um, uh, or for, for Kathy, um, <laughs> Feel free to ask the questions in the comment section of the, the YouTube uh, um, page, and uh, we will attempt to address them. I think we have one or two already uh, that, that uh, Kathy's going to pass along, that Mike is going to take on, and I will continue to do my role of nodding sagely. Kathy, I think you're muted. I'm unmuting myself. There we go. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see me. I'm not looking at the YouTube feed. Neither am I. <laughs> no? <laughs> All right. Well, I might be a, a faceless voice. Um, yeah, we've got a few questions, and um, I know you also have more, uh, Joshua, so I, why, don't we, why don't I read through some of these, and then if there's more time for you to ask some more of your questions, we can do that. So the first question is, do you, for Mike, do you think the capitalist economy will recover from this recession slash depression 
in a way similar to the way it recovered in 2008 by passing along the economic damage to the lower classes, getting huge bailouts and carrying on mostly as before, but with larger wealth disparity? Or do you think the changes will be longer lasting? In a broader sense, to what extent is there no coming back from this? And to what degree will these disruptions necessitate radical redistribution? Big question. Oh, okay. My view is that this is the terminal crisis of the historical period that began with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, the neoliberal era of increased globalization of, of production and also of deregulation of industries and deunionization uh, throughout kind of the, the G20 uh, countries. But what we're seeing in America right now is not simply that people are out of work and suffering, but that it's very likely that we are in a period of mass immiseration and, and the loss of, of, you know, ordinary wealth that we haven't seen since uh, 1932. And there's no bailout bill that's big enough to put all that together, particularly when your administration, who sees the crisis as a great opportunity to, for instance, destroy the American Postal Service and privatize its functions and advance the interest of its campaign contributors and so on, but has absolutely no strategic vision. I mean, Trump compared to uh, Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover was a genius, uh, often derided for being unable to deal with the Depression, but he's a genius compared to the, uh, the White House today. And in a conversation I had a few days ago uh, with the British Marxist philosopher Alex Kalinikos, he made a couple of, I thought, really incisive points. The first of all is the the you know, our economy and most of the economies in the world are still, you know, completely disordered or ordered by 2008. Sure, we've patched the big banks back together, made them larger and ever, but all the fundamental distortions and contradictions in, in the economy made and are magnified. But as part of the disorder he talked about was, he called it a misalignment between uh, who holds peak political power and who are the, you know, the, the largest businesses and banks. I mean, look at Washington. This is very different from Ronald Reagan's Washington when you had the business roundtable, which came very close to the caricature of an executive committee of the, uh, uh, the ruling class. All the largest corporations and banks united around deregulation and union bashing to today where so many of the uh, dominant figures are second and third ranked uh, capitalists, uh, uh, like the DeVoy's family, who, like, or the biggest family in Grand uh, Rapids, Michigan, not hitherto known as the World Financial uh, or Industrial Center, or our oil men who are billionaires, but hardly, you know, rate right in the same, uh, the same way. This is a very curious position, and it's similar in England, where the Brexit phenomena has promoted uh, sectors of what you would call the, the lower and more ins insignificant ranks of capital uh, into power. Do they have the ability to uh, find a, uh, a way out of the, you know, out of the crisis? Well, we got out of the Depression, well, of course, ultimately because of World War II, but we got out of the Depression because on, on one hand, uh, the most advanced parts of uh, American capital, like in the electric and auto industries, uh, grudgingly were ready to accept unionization, and unionization created a powerful impulse for more technological investment, leading to doubling of the economy uh, in the 1940s. But at the helm, uh, we had some of the most brilliant figures, uh, the first half of uh, uh, the 20th century, the New Deal. They weren't agreed on a common program. They all had their 
their different projects, but it ultimately congealed. I can't imagine anything remotely similar happening right now, and I don't see it uh, in a possible Biden administration. In other words, I have a consistently dark view of what the next decade will be like, and I think that the the extinction of such a large part of the retail sector is going to mean that a large number of the people who are in the precariat or who are contingent workers are going to end up amongst the permanently unemployed in the period ahead. And as mentioned earlier, to the extent that factory production is repatriated here, it will increase uh, automation. We've all heard uh, all kinds of of uh, forecast about you know 20, 30, 40 million American jobs that will be eliminated in the next 15 years by automation. Whether that's true or not, uh, an awful lot of people believe it. it. I mean, it seems to me that's right, and it seems to me that you know one of the reasons that the Trump administration, let's say, doesn't have that business roundtable and seems to be just sort of nakedly about power in certain ways is that. It's, it's impossible to imagine sort of economic expertise. You know, Reagan had, like, I hate to summon his name from the depths of history, right, but there was David Stockman and figures like that who, at least there was an economic theory. There's not even vaguely an economic theory now, maybe Lighthizer, we could debate that, but um, there's not really an economic theory, and there can't be, which is to say, like, I think the, the end of growth uh, you know, is here with us as a fact. There's no imaginable, you know, uh, sort of economic thinker who could show up and say, here's how growth can happen again. Everyone knows it's off the table. And given that oh. that's the case, I think that, that pure power comes to the fore as a, as a legitimate desire in some sense. Yes, I mean, and I guess what I'm saying is in the past, you've had very advanced sections of capital uh, whose interest was creating a social framework for fast accumulation uh, and for expanding domestic demand, that is, raising wages. And you've had dynamic labor movements uh, able to make themselves part of the uh, distribution of income. They, they were crucial factors in the uh, uh, macro economy of the 1940s uh, and the 50s. What we've seen since Reagan is the rise of this mentality of consuming all the good things of Earth and our light and then just, you know, bugger the future generations or anybody else. And the Trump administration takes this to probably its uh, highest and hopefully, uh, you know, final point. There is no longer any vision, long-term vision of capital, any sense of preserving uh, the traditional manufacturing base uh, of the economy. What's more is that right now there is, of course, an extraordinary revolution in the biological uh, sciences in uh, uh, next generation gene sequencing and biodesign, <clears throat> being able to design proteins right down to the uh, atomic uh, level. I mean, these are the forces uh, that can ultimately control uh, the uh, age of, uh, of pandemics, but the pharmaceutical industry, private medicine, and uh, very right-wing entrepreneurial states are direct roadblocks to the development of that. The big pharma firms, I think three of them, who now claim to be developing vaccines are all piggybacking after smaller dynamic firms. They'll just by the patents after it happens. But they fail in the most fundamental way to develop lifeline medicines that we require, to develop new generation antibiotics, to deal with uh, this plague of uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria diseases, new antivirals. We should have had a universal influenza uh, vaccine is capable of because it would attack the, the conserved, the stable parts of the surface proteins of influenza. Uh, it would stop flus of all kinds. It would cease to be a need for seasonal infection. And of course, we need 
medicines to deal with tropical uh, diseases because, of course, global warming is bringing the tropics and tropical diseases north. For example, Europe, which had a huge malaria problem, even as far north as England, in the Middle Ages, and in Italy, right down to the 20th century, you're undoubtedly going to see the return of malaria. Dengue fevers moving uh, north, and new emergent viruses or bacterial diseases will also uh, be uh, propelled by climate change and changing biogeography uh, into new areas and to populations that have no previous experiences with the virus, uh, like in our case today with this particular coronavirus. Yeah. I feel like I've really like, like pierced to the heart of a certain reality when I watch cable news. I watch CNN. Here I am stuck in my house. So I watch CNN and it's, it's coronavirus 24 hours a day. And their main advertiser, which was uh, Cruise Lines, has now, of course, vanished entirely, and it's just Big Pharma. So all I see is coronavirus news and then Big Pharma ads for things that are, you know, not the vaccine, not a flu vaccine, not any of these things, but just these sort of profit-making schemes. And I feel like I sort of, that's my moment of seeing how the world works or some uh, layer of it. Kathy, I think you have uh, more questions yeah. coming in? Yeah. There's more questions coming in. Yeah, thank you. Um, this one's for uh, both of you. Um, do either Mike or Joshua have any comments or predictions on how COVID-19 could impact undocumented migration, especially as it relates to the deglobalization concept? Well, of course. I mean, this uh, increases wall building across the world. It increases scapegoating. Uh, I mean, we're seeing, you know, one of the ugliest periods in American <clears throat> history right now. Uh, and the attempt to uh, turn diseases uh, into, into people, particular groups of, of people. I mean, I think some people, some of us have believed that the yellow peril uh, was gone and vanished. You know, a relic of the early 20th century, late 19th century. But here we are, we're full blast and back to the time of the Yellow Peril. And China and Chinese bodies as being uh, fatal disease threats to uh, people in the rest of the world, which is, of course, uh, you know, nonsense. But it seems that President Trump is making uh, this idea that uh, coronavirus was developed in a uh, Chinese biowarfare lab and deliberately set upon the world. Uh, I saw a poll, a Pew poll, that showed that 25% uh, of Americans believe exactly that because they've heard it in Fox News or they've uh, learned it online. Another consequence of, of this crisis is it seems to be accelerating uh, the drift toward war, war of all times, but also uh, raise the possibility of not simply a new Cold War with China, but a danger of returning to a situation that existed in 1962 or throughout the 50s. Uh, you know, we're waving uh, hydrogen bombs at each other. Uh, certainly, this is what Trump seems to want. Yeah. You know, I think, I think we've, we've already, uh, you know, been seeing for quite some time the phenomenon of climate refugees on a massive scale. Uh, you know, uh, millions, millions and millions of people set loose across the planetscape, fleeing disasters that are often have multiple aspects to them, but which are in part climate driven. Andreas Malm, I think, has been one of the great uh, thinkers about this, but various people have, have, have written about it. And sort of in train of that and other developments, before the pandemic, I'd been trying to write about this concept uh, that, I, that, I, that I've sort of called green nationalism, right? Which is this idea that a sort of environmental logic, a logic of husbanding environmental resources would become not the basis for some sort of liberatory climate movement, but for a renewed and dangerous sort of uh, consolidations of state power in nationalist ways. And so, you know, the, the Christchurch shooter in New Zealand is the, is the sort of most horrific example of that, right? This idea that the nation must 
close its walls, as Mike said, protect itself against the incursion of um, the impure, who over and over again are Muslims in this sort of imaginary, right, in, the, in this perfervid fantasy, uh, but must close their walls, close their borders against those who are impure and who would, you know, improperly appropriate the natural resources of a nation. And so that sort of green nationalism, I think, is already a rising threat in various ways. Uh, and I, I think it's, you know, um, unfortunately the case that we're going to see a, a, a mutation of that, an intensification of that in relation to the pandemic, right? We've already seen it, this closing of walls against this imagined uh, other, the, the refugee uh, set loose by the pandemic, by, by, uh, by poverty, by immiseration, by climate change, and it's going to come to a hard border for a nation that fantasizes it can somehow keep itself pure and, and protect its own resources. And it's, this is going to be deadly. Um, and so even though we all want to be sympathetic to sort of climate discourses in various ways, this formation of green nationalism, I think that the left, um, I use that term always with some hesitation, but the left has to be uh, absolutely committed to uh, oppose the sort of sedimentation and consolidation of that mode of governance. I think that's, uh, those are shrewd points. I completely agree with you. I think the best example and the scariest example right now is the use that Modi and Hindu nationalism yes, yes. are, are yes. making to the pandemic. And uh, not only do Muslims uh, kill cows, uh, now they're bearers of fatal uh, uh, diseases as well. In terms of climate change, I, I tried to argue in a an essay I wrote years ago, that really there are three interlinked kind of macro crises of humanity, and that global capitalism cannot guarantee human survival in any of these three cases. <clears throat> One of them is the fact that uh, capitalist world system no longer generates jobs for people. It's an odd thing for Marxists to say, but uh, the complaint would be that it doesn't exploit enough people anymore. So a very large minority of uh, humanity, including the majority of the urban workforces in Latin America and Africa and parts of South Asia, uh, exist in a subsistence economy. There's surplus to the needs of the expanded reproduction uh, of, of the world economy. And this is a desperate and central uh, crisis. And I've always argued that environmentalists in, in provoke, uh, proposing uh, uh, to conserve some open space or to fight against global warming, it always should include uh, proposals for hiring uh, unemployed youth or for creating jobs. Because to a great extent, uh, groups like the Sierra Club have let... Uh, uh, the arguments be, you know, be stolen by right-wing forces who, you know, claim to be the, the, the uh, representatives of working-class heroes. The second crisis, of course, uh, the climate crisis itself, we almost always talk about <clears throat> mitigation. And, of course, it's vitally important that uh, we mitigate, do our part in, in the worldwide struggle to reduce carbon emissions. It's I think almost impossible to imagine at this point that the current governments in power, capital as a whole, are capable of actually decarbonizing uh, the world's economy. And what's so frequently not talked about are the cost of adaptation. Now, climate change is different from pandemic disease. As uh, you were saying earlier, there's no way that uh, elites or wealthy middle classes can wall themselves off uh, from the danger of pandemic disease incubated in uh, uh, poverty. But it's different, <clears throat> excuse me, it's different with climate change. It creates a far more invidious situation because the countries that have produced the bulk of the green and gas gases are not the countries that bear uh, its, its most drastic consequences. So there's no particular interest uh, 
or elites in a rich, wealthy country. What is their self-interest uh, in saving Bangladesh or Pacific Islands or uh, the Amazon rainforest? Their self-interest in it is very difficult to see, more likely that they will build these spiral fortresses uh, that you talked about. And now added to that is, of course, the fact that you've broken down the last barriers uh, between human activity and uh, what have always been isolated and, and kind of deeply reclusive reservoirs of, of disease. The U.S. agency that Trump had funded in uh, last year identified more than 1,500 coronaviruses circulating in, in bats and only studied about 150 bat species. There are actually about almost 1,600. There's absolutely enormous reservoir of coronaviruses, of influenza, sort of all kinds of uh, particularly RNA viruses uh, waiting to escape, to be transmitted through the medium of some wild animal or even domestic animal uh, uh, to humans. Part of that is due to the desperation of subsistence farmers who push deeper into the forest, trying to eke out livings. But most of all, it's due to the multinational logging companies and it's due to foreign forest clearance for uh, raising the hamburgers we eat at McDonald's. Uh, this is one of the ways in which uh, this age of disease is, is produced in the most literal sense uh, by global capitalism. Great. Yeah, we've got a lot of great questions coming in. Um, this one's for Mike. Can you spell out the mechanisms you envision for revised left internationalism? And are there ideas that you have about how the U.S. left could build bridges to the Latin American left, for example? Well, it's sad if we have to build bridges because those bridges once existed and they were absolutely crucial to the identity of the American left in the uh, uh, 1980s and through the, uh, the 1990s. But the first thing we have to do is demand... Uh, a large relief program, medical relief and debt relief program. Africa bears an unsustainable version of, of debt. And the World Bank uh, right now is fairly panic-stricken about the kind of debt crisis that will explode. It will erase any of the pro progress made in sub-Saharan Africa over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, it will lead to uh, uh, greater migrations. Uh, but above all, uh, we owe it to our African sisters and brothers uh, campaigns and really all out uh, mobilization uh, demanding that Washington uh, and American banks uh, give total debt relief uh, to Africa and to other. Uh, poor countries. But as we ramp up the production of test kits and ventilators and so on, we're eventually going to have a surplus. We should start immediately sending part of that uh, to Africa and poor countries. And then on our doorstep, of course, is Mexico. And California's ties to Mexico, of course, are almost infinitely complex uh, and important, involving millions and millions of California uh, uh, families and so on. And right now, the only step that Washington has taken because of the pandemic in regard to Mexico is it keeps on building its uh, damn wall. That like I heard that it's actually speeded up corruption and it uh, has, of course, deported <clears throat> 10,000 uh, applicants for asylum, deported them in the dead of night secretly. And uh, we have to mobilize uh, against that. What an actual foreign policy of the uh, progressive wing of the Democratic Party and of the uh, left forces uh, to the left of that uh, would look like. 
should be uh, an obsession to us right now. We need to be uh, uh, thinking about that. And we need to be prepared uh, to like uh, the feet of not only uh, uh, Republican politicians, but in some cases, liberal Democrats, put their feet in the fire uh, over that. But I would think Africa and Mexico. Now, of course, this applies to internal colonialism as well. Uh, I haven't read much about what's happening on Native American uh, communities, but I have a student uh, who lives in the Navajo Nation, and uh, I've had a terrible outbreak there, and presumably uh, elsewhere. This will extend all the way to uh, the First Nations of, of, of the Arctic. But by the way, in the 1918-19, uh, Spanish flu suffered the highest casualties, literally whole villages uh, uh, die because people in the north have uh, had little experience at that time with influenza or, uh, you know, other diseases. Thank you. Okay, the next question is to both of you. <clears throat> what is your opinion on the national rent strikes taking place? And also, uh, what openings do you see being presented to create change due to this crisis and who are the key players or groups? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. That's a that's a that's several different questions. I've probably already forgotten a, a couple of them. But so I'm quite fascinated by the national rent strike. First of all, obviously I think it's great. Obviously I think there shouldn't be landlords at all, um, and I think that any pushback against landlords is desirable. I'm really interested in the question in ways that might be overly academic. You know, the last book I wrote was about strikes and riots and trying to clarify uh, what they are and how we think about them. And I get drawn into these debates. Is it really a strike? I don't care that much. I think it's a salutary movement. I think it's a really nice example of um, the, the collaboration between people struggling uh, people with political commitments and history itself, right? 30% uh, of the renters in the country uh, did not pay their rent on April 1st. Uh, and that didn't arise out of a massive amount of organizing. I'm not opposed to organizing. I don't sort of see a great virtue in sort of pure spontaneity or anything like this. Uh, but that didn't arise out of massive extent of organizing. It, it arose out of exigency. And it's, but it's going to set the term for what's possible. A lot of people just found out that if an entire apartment building says we're not going to pay our rent, you don't pay your rent and the cops don't come around. Now, is that sustainable indefinitely? No, that's going to take other kinds of uh, more broad based um, solidarities and, and mutual uh, aid and mutual support and mutual organizing. But I absolutely hope that it continues. Uh, and I think that uh, sort of bearing in mind that shape, uh, which is about the ways that sort of existing solidarities, but also ones that are called into being or maybe consolidated by sort of immediate events and experience are often going to be extremely powerful. And I think there's lots of examples like this. And so when I think about uh, kinds of social movements in the United States that I could imagine uh, um, emerging uh, o over the next months and year years. I think less about key players. I'm not, the framework of institutions, for example, is not one that I've always found as useful as, as some other people have. But I think that questions about sort of class relation and class structure and class mobilization are going to be paramount. Let me offer a brief example. I have a, a, a way I, I try to narrate the Occupy movement, uh, which is that it was an attempt to form a sort of interclass alliance between people who are uh, actively excluded from the economy, um, maybe unhoused already by the, by the economic crisis of 2008, um, but certainly pushed out of work, pushed out of the wage and excluded an alliance between them 
in what's sometimes called the downwardly mobile middle class, who also had been in various ways screwed over by the economic collapse of 2008, um, had experienced for the first time, perhaps, economic e exigency and precarity, and also recognized out of this that it was a bad situation. And I saw Occupy as an attempt for those two sort of class fractions, to use the classic term, right, to operate together and to form a sort of alliance or a solidarity and a movement. And it didn't quite happen. I think the main reason that Occupy um, came to an end is because of police repression, right? State repression. We shouldn't blame it on Occupy itself. But I think that alliance didn't quite happen. It seems to me that something like that is bound to happen again, which is to say, as Mike has noted so eloquently already, we're going to see even more people pushed out of the economy uh, uh, into not just being precarious, but being fully excluded, unemployed, unhoused. And we're going to see even more of the sort of middle class that has their lives really fractured, if not annihilated, uh, by uh, the COVID depression. We've already seen like the, the astonishing unemployment claims, right, and the closures of small businesses and so on. So those two categories, right, the, the indebted and the excluded, let's say, are again going to be intensified and expanded. And I think we'll again see something like uh, an, an attempt to sort of articulate them together into a single movement uh, or, or, or solidarity. And I think to loop back to the beginning, it will look very much this time, not like a movement of the squares, occupation of plazas and so on, but like uh, rent strikes and in, indeed attempts to sort of have neighborhood councils and have control of neighborhoods where you don't have landlords you're not paying rent because you can't, uh, and you're trying to have a kind of control over your housing and living situations uh, that's not dependent on landlords who will have less of a power to enforce their uh, uh, collection of, of rent. So that's my hope, is that something like the rent strike is going to blossom into a, a, a class movement uh, and that it will be able to proceed more effectively and with sort of a greater unity than in the end Occupy was able to. I'm curious to know if Mike wants to respond to that because uh, you know, I might have the same hope. Uh, uh, 30 years ago, uh, I was writing an article I used to write for the LA Weekly frequently, an article about the city of Bell Gardens, a small industrial city, poor city southeast of uh, downtown, uh, which had had a Latino majority for years, but was still ruled by the same bunch of white good old boys, because such a large percentage of the population didn't have citizenship. And in the course of my investigation, I was interviewing uh, the city manager, and he had to leave his office for half hour, 45 minutes, and, and told me just to wait in his office. And lying in one corner uh, were the tax rolls uh, for the city. And so I immediately pounced on them. And just working as fast as I could, I took notes on uh, landlord, landowner, landlordship in Bell Gardens. And there were two entirely different groups. 90% <clears throat> of the landlords were working class Mexican families that had managed over the years to save enough money to buy one to three units of housing or to turn their garage or property in, in, into rental housing. <clears throat> A small minority of the landlords uh, own from 10 to 150 rental units. They lived almost without exception in Orange County or the west side of uh, Los Angeles. And for them, Bell Gardens was simply a rent plantation, uh, which they squeezed as, as hard as they could. So in a situation like that, uh, that class uh, of large and speculative uh, landlords should be expropriated. The property should be municipalized. Uh, this is not the same as socialism or a revolution. Uh, it's happened actually in quite a few uh, European capitalist countries. But it's the obvious immediate solution. But with the other group of people, you know, the working class families for whom 
you know, one to three rents enabled them to send the daughter uh, to the university or to bring up some senior citizens from Mexico uh, to live with them. I consider that socially responsible landlordship, and it should be made affordable by giving tax breaks and cheap credit to people to build one or two uh, units of housing and supplement their incomes, at least as long as their incomes aren't uh, increased by unionism or uh, uh, and so on. I mean, this is really the major form of savings that goes on in so many immigrant communities. So I think you need to distinguish the two, wage ruthless warfare against the first, but look to the other as an important source of social provision of uh, affordable housing and provide it with supports, allow much more, many more people to uh, uh, do that. Okay, so we have um, barely 10 minutes left. Um, maybe time for one more question, maybe two. Um, the next question is to Mike. <clears throat> what kinds of changes should we anticipate transforming both urban landscapes and logistical architectures if we are living, as, as you say, in an age of pandemics? Well, even though I said on one hand that we will see a decline in world trade and cross-national logistics, obviously uh, the big winner out of this crisis are companies uh, uh, that are now uh, proven themselves to be so successful at delivering essential materials to our homes, uh, stuff we always used to shop for before, but uh, we'll probably continue to shop online for uh, as we become more used to it and the, they become more affordable, basically by paying their drivers and delivery and warehouse people uh, minimum wages. <clears throat> but the biggest victory, of course, is Jeff Bezos and uh, 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 Amazon. I mean, he's made already... Uh, uh, it increases his wealth by $5 billion or something, literally uh, within a month. And I wrote an article in The Nation saying, on one hand, you have this full-out Republican attack on the Postal Service. Okay. The Postal Service was excluded uh, from any of the uh, uh, $2 trillion that was specifically excluded by the Republicans. They want to prioritize it. And to privatize it, they have to make it fail, which is predicted to occur actually uh, this summer. So I propose something very old fashioned and very traditional uh, in American politics, which is a wartime excess profits tax. It was used by, Roosevelt, uh, by uh, Woodrow Wilson in the First World War, used by Roosevelt in the Second, German during the Korean War. So you cap the profits, uh, and it was capped during both uh, world wars at 7%. Anything above 7% profits, 100% uh, tax, uh, or it has to be uh, paid as a check directly to the uh, American treasury. So why not tax basis enormous super profits in the crisis <clears throat> to help rebuild and enlarge our uh, postal service? And I, I regard my letter carrier as one of the most heroic guys I, I know. Uh, the Postal Service is one of the major sources of decent uh, jobs for hundreds of thousands of people of color, of, uh, you know, veterans in, in this country. It's absolutely vital. We really have to uh, speak with our feet on this question uh, and soon. Thank you. Um, so, with five minutes left, maybe this is uh, the time to ask you, uh, Mike and, and Joshua, if there was anything um, that you didn't get to say that you'd like to say. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, there are so many things I'd, I'd like to say, but uh, let me just make one remark, and that is that people should not allow the simple coronation of Joe Biden uh, at the Democratic Convention. Some are even calling the convention off. It's more important than ever that we continue to struggle for Medicare for all, 
and that the fight continue at the platform uh, committee at the convention. Uh, today, a, a letter appeared in the nation <clears throat> signed by the former leadership of Students for Democratic Society in the 60s. It's so bad. Uh, so I was not one of the signatories in it because it basically, you know, said uh, this is like the choice between uh, the Social Democrats or, or or Hitler. You have to just step up and vote for, for Biden. I don't think this is a, a binary choice at all. I think there's real possibility of a successful fight in the platform for something which has now been revealed to be the life and death issue in this uh, in this country, it's quite extraordinary that you know the way in which uh, Bernie Sanders and, and later Elizabeth Warren anticipated this, made it the cutting edge of their campaigns, and now uh, the urgency of it is being validated in the most kind of existential way imaginable. Um, if I could say um, one last brief thing, that's if that's all right. It, it's on a somewhat smaller scale than um, Mike's point, which I uh, agree with. Um, uh, we both teach in the University of California system, which is the third largest employer and the sixth largest, largest economy in the world. Uh, in that system right now, some of the graduate students are engaged in a wildcat strike that I think is both honorable and courageous uh, for a cost of living increase to be able to afford housing and food, uh, which a great uh, percentage of them are so-called rent burdened and can't afford housing and food effectively and uh, they uh, deserve your support. And I hope that if you are at all adjacent to that struggle or know of it or a part of it, you will offer your uh, support in whatever way you can. Uh, and I wanna offer them my uh, strongest solidarity. And I wanna also thank Mike so much for this and thank the DHI of Davis and Kathy for hosting us. Well, I think, well, and I did, you know, my full solidarity on your last point. But we should make Amazon pay its goddamn taxes as well. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that Amazon. Amazon. What a great note to end on. <laughs> thank you both so much. This was really terrific. And thank you, everybody, for watching, um, viewing, listening, participating. And if you know of um, anybody who didn't get to watch, um, please direct them to our website, www.dhi.ucdavis.edu, where this video um, will be posted or linked to our YouTube page. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Keep up the fight. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.